Hi everyone, good afternoon, good morning. Um, on behalf of Erie Arts and Culture, it is my pleasure to welcome you to the first annual Arts and Agency Week, which is a virtual event designed to explore the ways the arts are being leveraged to raise awareness of systemic issues amplify underrepresented voices, and generate creative solutions to societal challenges. Funding for Arts and Agency Week was provided in part by the Erie Community Foundation through their Shaping Tomorrow program, grant program. My name is Tess Frawley, and I am the owner, gardener, and edible landscaper with Eat Your Yard. Eat Your Yard's mission is to plant the seeds of lifelong health, one yard, one family, one community at a time. Eat Your Yard is a comprehensive, comprehensive edible landscaping and consultation service in the Erie, Pennsylvania area. We believe that access to fresh, nourishing, and healing foods is a right of all people, and that it all starts in our own backyards. Today, I have the privilege of introducing Jay Salinas. Jay is an artist and farmer who worked to support development in sustainable agriculture in urban and rural communities across the nation, working with both Growing Power in Milwaukee and the Farley Center Gaining Ground Project in Madison. Trained as a sculptor, Jay has developed and implemented innovative and successful art curricula for both at-risk youth and at the university level. He has also taught sustainable farming techniques to farmers across the nation and continues to work with growers with diverse backgrounds and abilities to build sustainable food systems. Born in and raised near Chicago, Jay holds a BFA and an MFA in sculpture. Jay Salinas is with us today to speak about his work with Worm Farm Institute. Worm Farm Institute is an award-winning nonprofit whose mission is to integrate culture and agriculture. Worm Farm creates community cultural events like the nationally recognized Fermentation Fest and Farm Art Detour. Worm Farm also works to build regional networks through the Rural Urban Flow Initiative and hosts an er artist residency on a working farm. This presentation is live streamed through Zoom as well as Erie Arts and Culture's Facebook page and YouTube channel. The session will conclude with a Q&A. If you have any questions, please type them into the box. And at the end of the presentation, I will read the questions aloud to Jay for answering. We thank you for being present with us today and we hope you enjoy this presentation. Jay, take it over. Thank you, Tess. And thanks to all, everyone at Erie Arts and Culture for giving me this opportunity. Um, I saw the list of other presenters and, and what, a, what a really great uh, uh, cohort to be a part of. So thanks for including me in that. Also, uh, I was asked to make this presentation center on our roadside culture stand project which is a, a fairly long time uh, uh, initiative that we've been involved with. And, but it, we've never really had it be the center of a talk. So um, I have uh, developed a, a working hypothesis in this, for this talk. And that's uh, that the culture stand has been really, has been like a catalyst uh, for Worm Farm to uh, get, Receive this national recommendation recognition, which has, has happened the last few years. So I am going to go right to the screen share. I hope. Let's see how this works. Oh, so far not good. Let me see. Well, you don't have. Do you have a touch screen? There you go. Here we go. Great. How's that look? Everyone got that? Okay. Hearing no objections, I will continue. All right. So um, everything Worm Farm does, everything we all do, begins and ends with the land. And uh, we live in southwestern Wisconsin in an area of the country known as the Driftless Region. And that uh, refers to the lack of glacial drift that missed this area 15,000 years ago. There's a little southwest corner of Wisconsin, a little bit over into Iowa and Illinois and Minnesota. And it's a very ancient landscape. You can see here hills and valleys. Uh, and in this uh, view, you see a lot of this contour strip cropping, which was a, a technique that was um, developed out here in order to prevent uh, soil erosion. 
So that's that site. This is also the land on which the uh, Ho Chunk Nation, uh, the ancestral lands, and uh, so they have never left. They're still here. Um, really honored to work with them in several different ways and for quite a long time. This uh, word here you're looking at, which I'm not going to try and uh, pronounce, uh, is the Ho-Chunk word for the town of Regensburg, which is where we live near. And it, uh, if you can read that, it says, it refers to the, uh, this area as the land of cemeteries, which I guess has something to do with the uh, disparity in uh, death practices, burial practices. So uh, Ho-Chunk land, uh, long history here. There's uh, evidence of, of we have a lot of mound builders out here. Um, there's evidence of agriculture going back over a thousand years. A few miles away from where I, I sit at this moment is what's called the Holbert Creek Garden Beds, which are uh, remnants of thousand-year-old uh, raised bed gardens. Uh, and I, I grow with raised bed gardens. So I'm here representing the Worm Farm Institute. Uh, we're from Institute as a nonprofit whose mission is integrate culture and agriculture. And there's actually a farm at the heart of Worm Farm. This is this is it right here. This is where I live. Uh, that barn you're looking at is a uh, uh, hundred yards behind me here. This is an old dairy farm. We've been living here almost 30 years now. Uh, moved here from inner city Chicago. Um, almost completely ignorant of what happens in the country, made ourselves farmers. Uh, we were, my partner and I, Donna, were artists when we moved here, made ourselves farmers, and then eventually found a way to link those things. So uh, for you people out in Pennsylvania, uh, here's where Suck County is located. Something happened with the transferring the slide, and so Milwaukee and Chicago are displaced. They're not in Michigan and Indiana. They're actually on the western shore of Lake Michigan there. Uh, Sauk County in red there is about uh, uh, exactly halfway between the Twin Cities and Chicago. Um, and it's, and that, again, that southwestern part of the state is this, this driftless region. So here's uh, what some of the land around us looks like. This is our farm. Uh, this is uh, the garden out front here. I, I can look out front and see that right there. We, we raise uh, uh, vegetables here. We, we've been doing a uh, uh, CSA. Uh, so we have, have about four acres under cultivation and we market uh, the produce for CSA, which we've done for over 25 years now. Oh, excuse me. Uh, and since we're organic, what you see here in this image are some of the beds that are uh, have this uh, floating row covers, which is an organic uh, uh, pesticide or pest management technique. Um, we grow on a very human scale. You can see we grow very, uh, very diverse and very close together. This is uh, work that's 90% of it is done by hand. Uh, and like I said, I've, I've been doing it for not quite half my life now, but it's, it's something that I remain committed to and will probably do for the rest of my life. Uh, keeping a farm here is uh, growing produce, growing food is really central to Warren Farm's mission. And so maintaining this garden uh, keeps up what we call our field cred. Um, this, is, this is work that, that is really important to us and, and informs everything we do. So everything that you're going to see from here on out pretty much emanates from the farm. So keep that in mind. So not only have we... Um, grown uh, produce out here for all these years. We've also hosted artists. Uh, and, and, th and that was like from the very first moment we arrived here, our friends from back in the city wanted to come out and check out life in the country. And they found it just as inspiring as we did. And that those early um, visits have uh, morphed into what has become the artist residency program, which is Worm Farms foundational program. We were, um, incorporated in the year 2000 and the artist residency was the, the program that that uh, around which we formed so in that program artists come from all over the country to not only make art but work in the garden uh, we go to pains to stress that we are not an artist retreat but rather we're in engagement with the life of a working farm so part of a residency at worm farm includes a work exchange Artists work 15 hours per week uh, in the garden, not particularly challenging work, but really, again, key to the work that we do. 
So they get their hands in the dirt. Uh, they learn some things that they might have not have known before. They, uh, but they also uh, work a lot with food. So uh, at Worm Farm, the kitchen and food preparation becomes very central to most people's residency. And it's very likely that if sh someone showed up here, uh, you know, a sculptor showed up with moderate kitchen skills, they might leave being experienced bakers and fermenters, but they would always be creating their work. They'll have experiences here that they will have never had anywhere else likely, uh, chasing cows around the pasture um, or things they might not have looked forward to like working in the rain. We, we seldom do that, but that's, that's the type of experience that one might have here. Uh, but it's really, it's, it's all about the work and the, the inspiration that the, uh, the, the surroundings and the time and the space that people uh, are provided when they're here. This is a project that I'm uh, most uh, deeply involved in. Uh, it's a small program. We host three artists at a time. The season runs from May till October. And since I'm the uh, primary farmer, I work very closely with the artist. I do the review and uh, we're heading into our 21st year of this. And it's, it's always been just the most rewarding uh, thing. And again, uh, the, that it, the, the program that informs almost everything else that you're going to see when you come here. So, you know, the artists are making work in a barn, not quite ideal conditions, but it, it does have its moments. So this is stuff, uh, all, what I've shown you before takes place on our farm. We're about five miles from the town of Reedsburg, Wisconsin. Also about the year 2000, we purchased a building on Main Street in Reedsburg, uh, restored it. It's on the Register of Historic Places, but it also changed our focus from farm, from what we did on the farm, to now we had a literal presence on Main Street and our work started to take a much more public uh, turn at that point. So we did murals, a couple of uh, murals, historical murals for a few years. And then uh, in that storefront, we would also host uh, gallery exhibitions, uh, usually linking some sort of aesthetic pursuit with something, uh, a collection. Uh, we called it fine art and curiosities. So he, this one we're looking at here now. Uh, so that, that building is a former office and warehouse for a woolen mill that was uh, in center of downtown Reedsburg. And so now it's called the Woolen Mill Gallery. And this was an exhibit that acknowledged that history. Uh, this is a, one of our local farmers, a close collaborator, Laura Mortimer, who is also a spinner. So she's demonstrating how to transform raw wool into, into yarn, uh, which would then be turned into textiles. Uh, another, a few years after that, a project we did was the Puppet Fest. We did that for several years. We offered a, a free week of puppet making workshops in the city park and then closed out that week by having a, a parade, a puppet parade on Main Street. We did that for like four or five years. A lot of fun, a lot of work. Uh, and, and, and again, just uh, really uh, learning how to work with the public. Uh, I, I think it has to be stressed that, uh, so my partner and I, uh, Donna, uh, we moved here. This is not what we set out to do. This is what we sort of found ourselves uh, doing. You know, we, we launched a lot of these programs because they made us happy, because they, they, they sparked our passion. And then more and more went on, we found out that it, we actually had something to share and to say with our, our proximate community and started developing more and more programs that, that would uh, allow that uh, to take place. So here's sort of the, the ideal that underlies everything that we do, uh, this idea of culture shed. And this is a term that... Uh, <clears throat> I'm credited with coining back in 98 before we even, uh, before we even um, incorporated. And I mean, this, this is part of our learning here. I mean, uh, so I think maybe most people know what a, uh, a watershed is, and that's a, a geographic region that's linked by its, its uh, surface waters, right? So in our uh, training, become farmers and learning more about sustainable agriculture, we learn this term food shed. And that's uh, a, a region that seeks to become as nutritionally self-sufficient as possible. And so for us, it, was a, it, was, it wasn't a great leap to come up with the idea of a culture shed. And that's the idea that, uh, that a region should uh, speak to and inspire, the, the artist should be inspired by and speak to the primarily the uh, inhabitants of that community, but also, you know, not, uh, not cutting oneself off from the broader conversations. 
So this is an idea that continues to form our work to this day. Uh, and so keep that in mind as we move forward. So in our culture shed in Sauk County, uh, I mentioned the Driftless region, but Sauk County itself is a place with a really unique human and natural history. Um, I mentioned the, the Native American peoples that lived here forever, mound builders. Uh, we have uh, several uh, thriving Amish communities here, which is always a pleasure to work with. And uh, Wisconsin also has a, uh, a history of uh, self-taught artists. And this was at least as inspirational to us as anything else. This is the work of Dr. Evermore, uh, self-titled self Dr. Evermore. Um, this is his forever Tron, sort of the centerpiece of his maybe five acre sculpture park. The doctor just passed away last winter um, and Wisconsin is lousy with self-taught artists. So this was also inspirational to us as we began developing our vision for what Worm Prime would be. Um, so between the time we did the, uh, the puppet festival and, uh, and the work that you're seeing here now, which is the culture stand, uh, several things happened. One of which I mentioned in the introduction that I worked for several years in Milwaukee uh, with an organization called Growing Power, Will Allen, uh, MacArthur Genius was the founder of that organization. And uh, he's found great value in the work that we were doing and worked with him and for him for about 10 years. Also, we did a lot of community work uh, where we reached out to um, uh, farmers and artists in our broader community. And when we say artists here, we're also talking about chefs and writers and, um, you know, the watercolorists and, and learned about different ways that we could uh, help fulfill our mission to integrate culture and agriculture. And so that's when we came around this project. This is a roadside culture stand. This is the first one we commissioned. This was back in 2009. Uh, the artist was uh, Peter Flannery from Mineral Point, about an hour south of here. And the culture stand is a reimagining of the roadside produce stand, which is still a feature out here and maybe in places where you live also. But it also um, had the added, uh, a couple added things. One is that it's mobile. This is built on a, uh, a trailer. This one's a five by 10 trailer. And it, that it's designed and built by an artist. And that so the idea is that they look good whether they're opened or closed and they're, uh, they're versatile. Um, they can sell produce. They all, all had this, uh, this kind of informational kiosk attached to them where, where other things could be, other information could be shared. And they can go, go to different places. Uh, here you see uh, the vendor here is a, a mushroom grower, a local uh, organic mushroom farm who was using one of the culture stands at an event. And then you can, on the screen here, you see all the other information we're able to share. So that, this was number one, this was the prototype. It was very successful. So then we started launching a, uh, an initiative where we, we, we did a uh, competitive process through a competitive process. We would uh, commission three culture stands every year. And again, using this thing where they uh, were, were mobile, versatile, beautiful whether open and closed and durable they they had to be able to be uh, you know last for years and and uh travel it at highway speeds so here's one uh from the second round um uh, this is a, a group called oxbow uh based in milwaukee a group of uh artists and designers who built this one and there it is open this is a really ingenious one. You'll, this one's going to come up a lot because it's one that we've kept for ourselves and uh, used regularly at, in various uh, activities that we're involved in. So we were soliciting proposals from, from artists every year. We would convene a jury uh, and we got a little bit better at this every year, picking things out. Um, and here you see, this is a, a drawing of one that uh, again, looked, looked good when it was closed. Here it looked like it was open. Now, this is one of the more fanciful ones that we've ever built and it's really beautiful design. And it was built, although it was not the most roadworthy version that we would ever created. So um, it, it just, and it's part of that thing we, we learned. So this one could not travel at highway speeds and was uh, reconfigured later. So we also experimented with different platforms. This one uh, built on the frame of an electric trike uh, those those flaps open, drawers pull out. It's really really well done. 
Uh, we mailed, made one on the uh, frame on the uh, body of an electric utility vehicle. Uh, there's a, a company in, in Reedsburg that does those that they donated one to us. We were able to use that. Um, this one was uh, designed by a local uh, wood carver who works with the uh, Circus World Museum. Uh, Circus World might come up, but uh, he was a wood carver who did a lot of uh, restoration on circus wagons, etc. And uh, this was his version, really beautiful. And this is the one that I use regularly for selling produce. So this was what we what we thought the main idea for these things would be. And there, so I can go to farmers markets. It's a way to distinguish a, a grower from the, all the pop-up canopies everywhere. And we've called these entrepreneur mobiles, uh, halfway between a pop-up canopy and bricks and mortar. And we'll get into that a little bit more. So we also would bring them to, to different events. This is at, in, in Reedsburg. They have a concert in the park series. So we, we brought our uh, stand down there to just enliven the event. Uh, so little produce, but mostly just showed the flag, you know, attracted people. It was a curiosity and a way to spark conversation. So then in 2010, the, the third round, uh, we commissioned a, a stand from uh, the designer was in Milwaukee, an artist named Munir Bahadine. And uh, this guy here that you're looking at, this is Joey Rivera. He's a contractor in real life. And uh, Munir designed this and, and Joey built it. And uh, so this is in Milwaukee, and we decided to give them a little bit bigger of a rollout because um, this was really a kind of an important one for us. So when they completed theirs, or almost completed it, Joey's putting some last minute touches on it, we uh, convened what we called at the time a food chain, where we brought uh, a couple of these things. You can see there's my, my wagon in the middle there, and on the far end there is another stand uh, that we'll talk about in a minute here. So Joey, in addition to being a contractor, was also a ceramicist, so he got to show some of his work there. This was at an event in Johnson Park in Milwaukee. This is another stand that's being operated by uh, Chef Kimberly Anderson, and we'll talk about her a little bit more in a minute. So here's Chef Kimberly, blurry photo. Don't worry, we're going to come back and have some more conversation about her later. So also right about 2010, uh, Worm Farm was selected to host an event called uh, uh, museums on Main Street. Smithsonian, Smithsonian Museum has a project called Museums on Main Street, where they send uh, uh, pre-made exhibits out into the world to, to, to go to small towns, uh, populations of less than 10,000, and uh, towns are selected uh, to host this based on the strength of their supporting programming. So we had this great, uh, beautiful building downtown. The, uh, the the Smithsonian exhibit that we were competing for was called Key Ingredients, America by Food. And if you haven't guessed by now, that's sort of like right in our, right up our alley. So we were we were uh, fortunate enough to, to bring this to Reedsburg uh, and, and put it into our gallery. Uh, here you see kind of an example of, so on the right there is a piece of the, uh, uh, the, the, the Smithsonian exhibit. On the red wall is a series of paintings made by uh, local artists, food paintings. He was doing a painting a day. And on the left is the big uh, Jolly Green Giant point of purchase uh, display that was, uh, that was actually made in our town for many years. So our, our, this was part of our supporting programming, but you know, as we we're thinking about what what it was that we could do to attract the Smithsonian. And we were thinking about, you know, Wisconsin foodways. And uh, if people know anything about Wisconsin or if they, they think they know anything about Wisconsin, it's, it's beer and cheese, maybe brats, maybe sauerkraut. And what all those things have in common is that they are fermented. So our uh, idea for hosting the Smithsonian was uh, our supporting program we called Fermentation Fest, a live culture convergence. And again, this was 2010. Now there is kind of this uh, fermentation renaissance going on. And this was actually a little bit ahead of that. So um, we um, um, start, as more we looked into fermentation, the more not only as uh, the resulting foodstuffs, but the, the metaphor of fermentation was something that we really embraced. Here's a quote I, uh, that I can read for you. This is from Sandra Katz, 
uh, fermentation is that flavorful space between fresh and rotten where all the most prized delicacies exist. So uh, fresh and rotten. So fermentation is controlled rot. And if you're a farmer and if, if you, you know, if you deal with the soil, you know that decomposition is one of the most powerful and important uh, processes in, in our, in our existence here. I mean, that, that churning of, of the um, um, dead matter being turned into new soil being transformed. So we have this, uh, we love this, uh, the, the, um, metaphor of fermentation, which is about abundance and transformation, right? Every culture has some sort of fermented technique, fermentation technique, um, and fermentation uh, creates uh, dense nutrients, strong flavors, uh, extended shelf life, and altered states of consciousness. And we embrace all of those when we talk about fermentation. So even now, for, from you know, ten years later, we still love those uh, love those metaphors and, and use them often. So fermentation fest itself was mostly classes and workshops that took place in in businesses in downtown Reedsburg. Sometimes they were taught by you know the church ladies who've been making sauerkraut forever, and, and sometimes it's. Um, uh, taught by celebrity chefs. This is uh, Chef uh, Tori Miller from, uh, from Madison, about an hour away from here. Runs a you know a Michelin star restaurant called L'Etoile. Um And then we also got this guy here, uh, Sander Katz. Uh, and if you know anything about all about fermentation, you know Sander is sort of the current, mm, I'll say God of fermentation. Uh, he might not like that. So uh, we, uh, we, we lured him to come to Reedsburg for Fermentation Fest about a month before his New York Times bestseller, The Art of Fermentation, dropped. So when we, we signed him up, he was relatively inexpensive. Uh, but by the time he showed up, I mean, he had, he had a national following. So we were, we were really fortunate to, to, to do that. So... Uh, Fermentation Fest was probably one of the most popular programs that Worm Farm had ever participated in. Um, the town we live in is not wildly attuned toward cultural pursuits unless they take place with a ball. So um, up until the time we, we brought the Smithsonian to town, we were seen as sort of oddballs or people were not really ready to embrace us wholeheartedly. However, once you bring the Smithsonian to town, then the Chamber of Commerce, then all those business people, then they then they want to they want to play with you. And that's that's fine. So uh we did that fermentation fest, uh the key ingredients in fermentation fest, it was great success in our town. Um, but then the, the uh the museums on Main Street was going away and would probably never return. So we wanted to keep doing this fermentation fest since it was so well uh, appreciated, but we wanted to have some sort of new uh, centerpiece for it. So there was an idea that we had in our mind for a few years growing out of some other projects that we did that we called the Farm Art Detour. And as a, a catchphrase there, through the vision of artists, we explore the timeless connection between people and the land. So the farm art detour was a um, sort of a diffuse celebration. Here is a map of the uh, second detour route that we ran. Up on the top there is Reedsburg, the, the community that served as sort of the trailhead. And the, firm, uh, the farm art detour was like a 50 mile loop that would run through uh, rural Sauk County, going through small towns, going on uh, two lane roads, and bringing people into back roads and showing them the part of Sauk County that you might not normally see. Um, and if you can see, there's a, a series of numbers along that route, and each of those numbers represents a stop that we created or curated for people to see. So this was a, a self-guided tour. You would get in your car, you would drive the route in direction, you would have this map, and, and it would tell you what you would see along the way. 
So here, for instance, are the map stock category. So artworks refers to uh, works of commissioned, uh, works commissioned, uh, selected by a jury and commissioned from artists from across the country or even from around the world. We would have between eight or 10 of those every year. Uh, field notes are educational kiosks and uh, that explain different aspects of rural life. And you saw a couple of those at the beginning, you'll see some more pasture performances, and guess what that might be? Food chain, we're going to talk about that a little bit. Farm forms, et cetera. So anyway, here, here comes uh, the detour. Here's an example of the type of art one might see on the detour. One of the things, so these are uh, installed in farm fields along public thoroughfares. And uh, the, bar the barrier to engagement is about as low as you can go. I mean, we had a, a pretty, in addition to the map, we had a, a wayfinding system, signage along the way that uh, people could uh, could easily follow. But a lot of people would just stumble upon it also. So um, anyone could see this. There was no turnstile. There was no admission. There was no ticket. This was uh, out, out in the public. So um, here's the type of work that one might have seen on a detour. This is called Farm Frame. It's by an artist named David Wells, who grew up on a farm here. And this uh, this is a really wonderful piece because it Sort of, sort of shows um, the way this thing should work. You don't want to compete against the landscape. First of all, the, the world out there is enormously huge. And, and if you, you plot some sculpture out there or something that might look good in a gallery or even in a, you know, in a, a public place in a city, it's going to be one thing. But if, when you bring it out to the country, the world will swallow it up. So instead of allowing that to happen, here's an artist that, that uh, created a frame to, through which to view the countryside. And this frame is built out of detritus from, from farm machinery that a lot of the people who, who viewed this would, would have recognized what they were for. Uh, another artist from Madison, Brenda Baker, taking advantage of this existing farm infrastructure. These are old corn cribs, which no one really uses anymore, but they're these beautiful uh, remnants along the roadside. And she uh, wrapped them in some dyed muslin fabric and made a like little Japanese lanterns. This is a uh, artist making, uh, farmers making art out of hay bales and stuff. It's something that happens even without a detour. And so this is another artist sort of taking that idea and, and uh, building this larger than life um, vignette that is not only just a, a fabulous thing in and of itself, but there's also a message in there. We, we, feral hogs are becoming an issue in Wisconsin. So calling attention to it, uh, this is called Too Much Pig. Brian Sebasky is the artist. So many different types of people come to this show, uh, come to see this thing. Again, some stumble upon it and some seek it out. We've had people come from uh, coast to coast to, to converge on Reedsburg for uh, nine days in October when this usually takes place uh, and, uh, and and take a tour of the route here. So when, when we built this, when we installed this stuff originally, you know, this is all on private land. These are farm fields, usually hay fields that uh, that in late September or October are, are pretty much dormant for the year. They, they've taken the last cutting of hay. And we thought that it would be this thing where people would drive by and look out their windows and, and appreciate the artwork. But from the very first day this thing launched, uh, <laughs> getting out of their cars. And um, I mean, technically they're trespassing, but the, the landowners and farmers who are hosting these things, I mean, I, 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 let me do this for the first time and I'll probably do it. Separate. None of this stuff could happen without the express uh, approval of the landowners who, who gave us permission to put these things on their property. Then the next thing that happened is that uh, people got out of their cars and, and walked across the fields and, and engaged with these things in, uh, up close and personal, which uh, again was something that we didn't really anticipate, but how could we? We didn't really know how this would work. Uh, the farmers 100% uh, were, were fine with that. Fortunately, we have a uh, Wisconsin has an ag tourism liability law where uh, people can can wander your land um, for temporary events and uh, the, the, the host farmer will not be held liable for anything that ha 
that happens. Fortunately, nothing has. So, I mean, some of these things were, were just beautiful insinuations in the landscape and some of them engage in other ways. This was called, this is called Dumpling House. Uh, with a couple of women from, uh, from Minnesota. Uh, and inside, this is inside that thing that looked like a giant steamed dumpling. And every day for the nine days of the detour, they made uh, a different type of dumpling. Like fermentation, almost every culture has some version of dumpling, whether we call it an empanada. or uh, So they would... Uh, do a different type of dumpling every day, but also they engage people to, to, to solicit stories about their, their memories of making food. And so the way it would work is uh, Emily and Molly would, would uh, teach the first person that came through in the morning uh, how to make a dumpling. And then while they were doing it, someone else would come in and then that, that uh, person would learn from the previous uh, person how to make and, and and the day went on it was like it's like a game of telegraph that they would they would uh, uh, share this knowledge from one per, one visitor to the next throughout the day and uh, and 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 have great food as a result too. This is a really interesting piece that was created the detour in 2015 by the Baribu Range Preservation Association. Oh my gosh, too much to explain there. Anyway, it's, it's a conservation group. And, uh, and not not like an artist, like most of these people who, who are being commissioned. Uh, and they propose to go into a, a couple acres of woods uh, along the road, on the route, along the, along the roadside, and clear out all the invasive species in that uh, acreage, and then pull it all out and created this portal through which a visitor, a detourist, we call them, would be able to enter this restored uh, piece of woodland. And it was a, a super popular stop along the way. Here's another piece that sort of engages people. Uh, this is by a group of artists from Chicago. Oh, I think this is called Drift. And this is a, this raft that they built floating in, in the headwaters of Lake Redstone. Um, a lot to explain here, but it's made to look a little bit like an iceberg, but also the, the contours of that raft uh, conform with the contours of, of the driftless region. So they are calling attention to that history. And then here we go. I, I'm going to be here for a second. So this is also part of it. These are what they call glacial shots. Okay. So what they did, they, so the glacier that missed this part of the country still exists. It has retreated all the way up above the Arctic Circle, but it's, it's still on the North American continent. Um, so they had connections and someone went up there uh, to where this glacier was receding. They collected some of this glacial meltwater, shipped it back down to the lower 48, and then, the, uh, and then they gathered uh, different herbs and fruits and vegetables from the area here. I think you can see uh, one of these things that says it's jalapeno. And so they infused this glacial water with these flavors from things that had grown during that season. So you have this ancient water and this annual crop that, that come together and are frozen into a shot. And as you stepped onto that, um, onto that raft to hear the story, they would offer you like communion, a little, a little thing. So you'd link this, this ancient history, annual crop, and you get to take that into your body, which was a really beautiful thing, by the way. Uh, here's a piece that's called uh, Field Sketches. This is uh, an artist also from uh, Madison who, uh, using uh, shock corded tent poles and, and fasteners that she fabricates, uh, creates a sort of three-dimensional drawing of a typical Sauk County farmstead, even to the point where the, the barn there is sort of sway backed. So it's a pretty, uh, pretty beautiful piece. Uh, Peter Crisco, again, is this beautiful insinuation on the landscape and a, a kind of an iconic picture. Uh, there's also performances. The artist that we work with on the puppet parade all those years ago uh, created this. This is a 20 foot tall skeleton puppet. And what you don't see is there's a, like a construction crane that is uh, operating the, the, the puppet. And so this was a collaboration, not only between the puppet artist, 
but a local construction company enlisted one of their operators to come out and help him do this. This was a really wonderful collaboration. So another piece of the detour I mentioned was called Farm Forms, and that's artist, uh, art created by farmers. Uh, here's an example of that. This is uh, Larry Month, who's a dairy farmer, and he has painted a silage bag, this uh, 300 foot long uh, piece of everyday farm life that contains food for cows. It's actually fermenting in there in the silage bag. And he and his family uh, painted it up to look like a monarch butterfly. Super popular uh, stop on the on the farm art detour. Here's another couple of farmers. Uh, I think I mentioned hay sculpture before. And so uh, these uh, Rodney and Tom Siemens, a father and son, created um, a new sculpture every year with a route ran by their place. And there was always a border collie that was a part of it too. These things are print presented alongside with the, the, the commissioned artist and, and you know, it's up to people to, and these are in some cases, many cases, more, more popular than the commissioned uh, artwork. So this is a collaboration between several farmers, uh, an engineering company and a construction firm who created these letters uh, acknowledging that wealth lies in the land. Um, these are these things called field notes. And, you, and again, you saw these at the beginning, um, explaining different aspects of rural life. Um, you know, lots of people, you see corn growing all the time, but <laughs> people don't really know where, where what you do with corn. You know, we, we answer that question all the time. So here's corn, here's one for wetlands. Uh, we also did performances in farm fields. These are dancers who are wearing uh, tutus made out of uh, uh, corn husks. Oh, look at here. Here's a culture stand. That's right. We're going to get back to that in just a second here. So this is all stuff that takes place during the during the detour. So uh, pasture performances, this the, uh, brass quintet playing on an old farm foundation. And then there's just this stuff here. This is uh, This is what we call a rogue installation. Uh, someone built this on their property to coincide with our event, but didn't tell us. And they just, it's, you know, for us, it's like the highest level of, uh, of success is when people feel uh, comfortable sharing their artwork in, in this rogue form with, with our event. Okay, back to the culture stand. So culture stands were always part of the detour. Um, and the, the first couple of years, we would place them at various points. This one is up at, up at the church here above uh, Lake Redstone. Here's another one that's by the Winfield Town Hall. You've probably seen this a few times. Here's one that's up at the Art Asylum. And this was okay. You know, they, we got, the, got them out there and intrigued. This is our Milwaukee friends. But one of the things you notice is not many people are there. And so we were trying to figure out ways to maximize the use of these things. So one of it was getting the type of products that people wanted. One thing we found is that they, they weren't necessarily looking to buy produce. They were looking for things to eat and drink right now. So here's a coffee vendor, and you can see he's getting to work. The other thing we started doing is starting to clump them together. Instead of putting one here and one there, we started bringing them together in, in what we called the food chain, which we had first realized in Milwaukee. And these became a little bit more popular. People came and they lingered. And as the vendors uh, would come back from year for year, because we've done this thing six or seven years now, um, they would feel more comfortable in the stand and they would, their displays would uh, take advantage of this, of this culture stand that they had used for a number of years. And they actually became associated with that stand, especially during the detour. So as they, as they appeared in year after year at the culture stand, they would say, oh, where is... Where is faith and physiology? Oh, that's right. She's going to be up by the church there. And they would find her and, and conduct business. Um, you know, the coffee vendor and their, how their whole display and, and serving uh, is sort of adapted to the stand that they are using. So they have this large platform in the middle there where they're able to brew the coffee and then out front there where they're, they're selling their roasted beans. And then these uh, food chain sites became areas of, of lots of activity and, and the one place 
in this uh, detour where people would gather. Otherwise, it's this, it's this sort of sequential, this caravan that's moving along, but people would stop and gather there, and they would talk about what they'd seen on the detour route, and they would, and they would support these vendors, and they would linger, and they'd spend some time, and this was a place along the detour where the, this kind of uh, the festival really, really took place, right? And all sorts of wonderful uh, activities took place out here. And we'll talk more about this stuff later. So here for, here, for instance, is a food chain site uh, in the off hours. Everything is closed up tight. Everything is secure. And then in the morning, it comes out, and, there's, and there we are, instant, instant activity. So, and so we use these culture stands all, all the time. Uh, this is at a local event called uh, Freedom Fest. And so we, we brought our stand there and, you know, it's like tabling, but instead of, again, at a pop-up tent and a folding table, you have this mobile eye-catching platform from which to share your information, right? So we get called, you know, we go to Madison for their Food for Thought Festival, and here we are right, right off the Capitol Square sharing information. Uh, we've gotten into farm aid a couple of times with our culture stands here. This is in Chicago three times. So this is in Chicago in 2016, and we brought some of our resident artists to participate in this. Uh, um, and we get to meet, so y'all probably don't know who this is, but uh, that, that white-haired gentleman is George Johnson, uh, who is the, was the president of the National Family Farm Coalition. So for me, to have him show at our stand, I'm, I'm all fanboy in here now. So it was, it was great to meet him and, and, and have him, you know, be attracted by our thing. We also used the culture stands to uh, in, enhance some of the other projects we did. For a number of years, we did uh, it re related to fermentation and, and uh, et cetera, the uh, decomposium. So a, a day-long event uh, where we you see uh, soil, music, geology, bacteria, et cetera. But then we would also set up a, a food chain outside and folks would be able to come and during breaks and the speakers or different things they were doing inside park hall would have the opportunity to come out and support these vendors again who i, I have to stress that they become like they become part of a cohort part of a worm farm food chain cohort and and work with us in, in many different ways uh we got invited to go up to the uh uh, Midwest Renewable Energy Fair, which is like a perfect demographic for us. A bunch of old hippies up in northern Wisconsin, uh, 25,000 people. And so not only do we bring our culture stands, but we bring these vendors. So we're promoting the stuff that we're going to do later, probably Fermentation Fest. They get a chance to share, uh, the, the vendors get a chance to share their work, physiology, and the coffee people. And then I even get a spot on stage. So we, we come as sort of a package, we're invited in. So it's a way of leveraging those opportunities in our presence. Uh, there's my partner, Donna, who's heard it all before. She's being very patient with me. But it's also inspired other organizations to do, their, to do some of this work. This is uh, uh, a, a art cart that was built by the Kohler Foundation, uh, Wisconsin, uh, as the uh, the Kohler people who are mostly known throughout the world for the bathroom pictures, but they also have a really uh, uh, significant arts component of philanthropy, and they commissioned this. Uh, this is a mobile kitchen, but it's also a rolling artwork. This is what you can do with money. Our, is what you can do on a, a shoestring. This is what you can do if you have uh, lots of funds. Okay, so back to Chef Kimberly a second, because this is another part, is that we've helped use this uh, food... Uh, the culture stands to develop entrepreneurs. So Chef Kimberly, right, we've talked about her. Uh, this is the first year she was at Food Chain uh, in, in that stand that's now being used by the coffee guys. But she, Chef Kimberly was a chef who had sort of burned out in the, uh, in the kitchen world or that had worked with us for many years on other projects. And when we found out that people wanted ready to eat or things they could take away, she agreed to make some jars and some pickle some stuff for us. And she was able to sell this stuff because in Wisconsin, we have a cottage food bill at the time it was called a pickle bill and allowed uh, uh, chefs to, or, or cooks, people to sell food that they made in their home kitchen. They didn't need a commercial kitchen as long as they stayed below a financial threshold, I think it was like $3,000. So Kimberly, to help us out, 
a can of a bunch of produce using old family recipes, sold it to the food chain. And, and I, uh, and in that first week of selling during the detour, exceeded the threshold for uh, the pickle bill. So it had to go legit. So we then uh, re-outfitted a culture stand for her. Uh, she now has a, a thriving business called Chef K. Clark Pickles and Preserves. She was associated with this culture stand for many years. We, we uh, cu- customized it for her with those shelves. And uh, she has always been a key vendor, uh, a key partner in, in, in a lot of this work that we've done. In, even in other events when she doesn't get to use her culture stand, but we can bring her out uh, and she gets to share her food. We get to share our message and those things. They, there's that kind of synergistic relationship. Uh, and, and every once in a while, we get to do a, a fancy food event. Uh, and then your chef Kimberly, who's already part, you know, she's part of the Worm Farm family, uh, gets to pull out, dust off her chef's whites and, and put a fancy meal together for us. And then when her business has reached a point where it doesn't make sense for her to go around and do farmer's markets, she returned the stand to us and we were able to pass it on to another vendor. So this is uh, Venus Williams here, and we're going to come back to her in a second. Okay, now we're going to talk a little bit about rural urban flow. So this is that uh, that Milwaukee-built stand. Munir Bahadine built it, and we brought it out to uh, Sauk County for the, for the detour, uh, Amaranth Baker was was, uh, was one of the vendors in there, and then this woman, Martina Patterson, who was sharing some of her upcycled, recycled urban fashions in Lime Ridge, Wisconsin. So um, this was a pretty incongruous match, but she was so game, and it was kind of cold and windy up there. She was there for a week. It was a really wonderful experience. And then she came back a couple of years later, she ended up being a resident on the farm. And that was a really great thing. And now uh, she is an organizer for this Rural Urban Flow Initiative about which you're gonna hear more in a second here. Uh, so then the artist that, that designed that stand, Munir Mahadeen, this is Munir right here, uh, working, this is kind of his signature project. This is what he really does. He makes this thing called Peace Posts where he works with communities to uh, to create these little clay tiles. Uh, then he then sets these tiles into a wood post and installs them into a community. So these are all over Milwaukee. I mean, he's a, a community-based artist. So to get him to come out here to Sauk County and do this work was really remarkable. And then we got those things installed in City Park in Reedsburg. So they're part of permanent installation. Again, this comes out of that introduction that we, we uh, initially achieved through the culture stands. Okay, then as part of the uh, detour for several years, we had, because of our connection, we had bus loads of farmers and artists, or as we called them, creators and producers who would come to Milwaukee to, uh, to take a ride on the detour. Uh, this is the bus that came. This is an artist named Della Wells, who is uh, like the grandmother of Wisconsin, uh, Milwaukee art. She's uh, a force of nature. And the fact that she came out to uh, Sauk County to see what we're up to is, is a great sign of success. So these bus, buses would come, folks would get out and engage with the artwork just as if they were regular detourist. They'd come in and listen and learn a little bit more about what we're up to. And then uh, they also brought uh, their own instruments and they would get out at like this food chain sites, pass out percussion instruments, and then get us all playing and singing. And this is one of my favorite worm farm or favorite detour memories. This was like in the last day of the of the detour. This bus late in the day, uh, John Mays, uh, the gentleman in the foreground there, passed out uh, all these percussion instruments and led us all in learning how to do polyrhythms. and And then Munir was there, and we learned Swahili chants. And this is in in Lutheran Sauk County. There was probably fifty people drumming and dancing, and it was a really beautiful and powerful thing. And we thought, you know what? We need to reciprocate. We need to go back and visit those guys on their home turf and bring our folks out there. And while we were planning this, this thing happened. This is an electoral map from 2016, uh, which shows the results of the election. Uh, 
course, the blue being areas that voted for the Democratic candidate and uh, the red areas voted for the Republican candidate. And it reveals this schism that regardless of what you thought about the outcome of the election, this is not a healthy dynamic. So this work that we were talking about, this rural urban flow, gained much greater urgency and intentionality in, in the work that we were doing. So we sent, uh, we called it the re reverse flow bus to Milwaukee. And we put a bunch of uh, artists and farmers, creators and producers from Sauk County and took a tour of Milwaukee, places of culture and uh, that are kind of off the beaten path. I mean, folks out here, if they, if they go to Milwaukee, they go to the river, or the sort of lakefront for Summerfest, or they go to maybe the art museum or, or the ballpark, but they don't come to uh, the Amaranth Cafe. And this is Muneer again, uh, leading a discussion about things going on in the neighborhood there. Uh, here's that same group on that same trip. And here we are uh, with Evelyn Terry at the Terry McCormick Gallery. Uh, Miss Terry is an artist and the and a, and a culture bear. Her home uh, is like one of the most spectacular repositories of uh, late 20th century uh, African-American art uh, in Milwaukee. Uh, here's Muneer again in his studio sharing his culture stand, I mean, not his, his uh, peace pose project. Uh, and then in, in the picture there, the center is uh, farmer Larry Month, who he last saw uh, on top of a silage bag, painting it to look like a monarch butterfly. Uh, here's Della Wells again, uh, and we saw her last in the bus in Milwaukee, but now here we are on her home turf. And so this is this really important connection between these urban and rural peoples, helping to overcome their misperceptions about one another. Okay, Venus Williams, uh, this is Pastor Venus, uh, a Lutheran, Lutheran minister, and but also the primary mover for a project called Alice's Garden, which is a, a community garden in inner city Milwaukee. Here she is sharing what happens on uh, at Alice's Garden with a group of visitors from Sauk County. Uh, and this was like several years ago, but this is just the beginning. Um, there's still all sorts of hard work to do. So we actually convened a summit. They, we, we brought a group of the folks from Milwaukee out to uh, Sauk County, where we, we actually sat and worked for weekends to figure out how and what and why we needed to talk to one another. So this is one of those uh, moments there. Here's that group that, that, that met there. So uh, perhaps you can see Martina in there. Uh, there's also uh, two uh, Ho-Chunk artists, uh, Melanie uh, Sines and Elena Terry, uh, who came from the Sauk County side. And, and then here's what grew out of that. So here's uh, Muneer and Martina working with, uh, with Melanie Sines, the founder of Little Eagle Arts Foundation, uh, uh, again, a, a Ho-Chunk culture bearer and artist and working on a uh, ceramic mural for a piece of land near here that has been recently uh, been ceded to the Ho back to the Ho-Chunk Nation that uh, we know as the Badger Army Ammunition Plant and which they know as Mawaha Chunk, meaning the sacred land. And so they got to work together and create this, this mural with uh, multi-generational Ho-Chunk families and they're gonna be doing another project this year. So this is a, a connection that was made through the detour and through the rural urban flow. Uh, here's also, there's Elena Terry, Venus Williams and myself sitting at table, having a conversation about sharing seeds and doing a seed exchange. This, I cannot tell you what an honor it was to sit with these two. Um, and, and here's a reminder, this is how it all began. This, this, all this stuff was launched because of these, the, uh, the culture stands were the vehicle that allowed for these relationships to develop. So there we go. That's what I got for you. One, just, just, just under an hour. So. By one minute. Thank you so much, Jay. Yeah. Yeah, this was this was absolutely wonderful and inspiring for me, and I hope for the rest of the crowd and those who will watch later. So we're going to open it up to questions, and if you want, you can go ahead and type those in either the chat box or the Q&A box. And, um, 
wait for some of those to roll in. So yeah, we, we do these talks quite a bit, but it, I think this might be only the second time I'm doing it via Zoom. So it's, you know, it's nobody's natural uh, um, format, but um, I, I hope it was intelligible and, and coherent. Oh, definitely. All right, we have a question here. Are you planning for more culture stands? Uh, yeah, as a matter of fact, <laughs> um, we, it, it was something because, because we got caught up in that fermentation fest and detour thing, which probably absorbs more than half of our time these days. We sort of got away from that a little bit, uh, making new ones. Excuse me, but there, there have been a few that have been built in the, in the past few years, and we have plans uh, for one coming up in the, in the, in the next year here. Um, it's a, a project that, um, so, I mean, let me, let me tell you uh, something really quick about that, is that, you know, we began by doing these with a kind of a, we'd send out an RFP, we'd have a jury, we'd pick out the ones we like best based on our criteria, and then they would be built, and then we'd try and find an end user. But the way it's evolved now is that now we, we work with an end user to find an artist and a design that will serve their function. So that, that was a, a major change in the way the program has evolved. And that's what we'll be doing this year, working with a, a, a group, sort of a fil- university affiliated uh, called Grasslands 2.0. And they want to share the, the spread the word, spread the gospel about grass-based permanent uh, co- cover agriculture, and so we're, we'll build something uh, specifically for them this coming year, I think. Me. All right, we have another question. So early on, you said that the work you were doing when you moved to the country was what you wanted and started to do. And it later yeah. grew into programs coming out of community. Can you talk yeah. about how that engagement grew? Yeah. Okay. So, um, so we, you know, we bought our farm. We lived in rural Wisconsin. Um, you know, we were city folks and we were outsiders and we weren't really certain about how best to engage with, with our, our proximate community. And so, you know, we bought the building and then we sort of felt we had this obligation to connect. And so we, we did the things that we want. We, we installed um, exhibits in that gallery space. We uh, did things, you know, the, the phrase, we followed our passions, right? Um, but we fo- also found that it didn't have a really significant impact on the community. So we, we, we installed some really great exhibits but very few people would come to them. You know, that's so a, a gallery was not the thing to do. We found, and so we did the uh, again the public work, the, the the murals, and those were still not really community based. It, it was they were inspired by uh, the the land in which we lived, but it, we the more we went on, I think we got better at interacting with with the community. So there was the puppet festival that again engaged directly with families. And that's when they learned that Worm Farm, you know, we were reasonable people who did, who did good work. But it was really, uh, so between the Puppet Fest and the, um, and the uh, um, key ingredients, uh, there, one of the reasons it's not in there because there's no really good images. We did a, a couple of years of some really uh, deep community work through a project called Homegrown Culture, where we did a series of, of uh, meetings, uh, it was a kind of sort of progressive dinner where we invited maybe 12 people to come to this first meeting where there was just food and, and a discussion. And then the idea was, is that the next, we were gonna do this again and everyone who came, their obligation was to invite somebody else who wasn't, who needed to be at the table. So we started uh, interacting with a much broader range of, of uh of people in the community, lots of farmers, lots of business owners who, who we weren't contacting otherwise. And sort of, uh, you know, we were presenting information, but we also learned a lot. And I think it's it was through that process, you know, I, I joke at times, they say it took the community like 10 years to recognize our genius. But I think what it really is, it, it took us 10 years to figure out a way that to interact in, in an equitable 
and um, um, what's the word, <clears throat> compelling way for them. So, you know, we, we adjusted, they adjusted, and we ended up uh, again where, you know, the, the embrace of what we do is not uh, 100% in total, but, but people still re do respect what it is that we do. And, and again, we have a, a pretty good track record of not doing what we said and having a positive impact in the community. And that, you know, financially, as well as creating, you know, cohesion within the community. You must work with a lot of different collaborators at different points. Um, my question is, how do you manage the, between that time and the time you spend on the farm developing or ma maintaining your, your farm cred? Yeah. Uh, do you, do you no. find the balance there? I find, so we, we, we you know, um, Donna, my partner, is the executive director of, of Worm Farm Institute. I am the director of special projects. So, so she's the boss over there. I'm the boss on the farm. We, uh, we always have, uh, for years, we've had seasonal staff because we, there's a, kind of this ebb and flow to our season. It really follows the growing season where right now we're, we're emerging from our dormancy. We'll have a lot of public programming through the year that will culminate probably in September, October. And then we, we contract again and we do lots of planning and, and reporting and, and writing proposals. And so um, that's one way is that there's this, this seasonal cycle for the work that we do. And then there, we just have these non-overlapping realms. Donna is primarily in charge over there. And I'm primarily in charge over here. And then the thing that's really helped us is now we have full-time staff helping Donna. This is brand new. So we, we got a program director. And so those guys take care of those administrative pieces. They do, I do a lot of the outreach, but then they do do a lot of the follow-up. And it, we've been able to divide and conquer that way. Great. And a question in from Jade Mitchell. What were the names of all of the tribes of indigenous people with whom you've worked? I believe you mentioned the, the Ho-Chunk tribe. The Ho-Chunk is the one with whom we work most closely because they're, because this is Ho-Chunk land. And there is this really beautiful thing happening uh, in the time that we've been here where, um, and, you know, it's kind of, it's a, it's a result of gaming, right? Um, since the since the casinos have started going up, it's provided a significant monetary impact for the for the uh, the uh, Ho Chunk peoples, and they are now revitalizing or reestablishing their primacy in the community here. So there's this this um, this um, uh, renaissance in in the food culture uh, with Elena Terry. She's she travels the country now. Um, sharing what she learned and also learning from other native chefs. Um, uh, Melanie Sines, you know, started her program, Little Eagle Arts Foundation, several years ago, and now they have they have a really a strong presence in the community. And through them, and through some other projects we're working with, that I means so uh, in the Milwaukee area, there's Potawatomi, uh, and so they're getting involved in some of the work we've done up in northern Wisconsin, the the Oneida and the Ojibwa have been involved in a lot of the food uh, system work that we've done. The Oneida have had a, 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 like a native food um, system developed for, they've been doing it. I don't know that they've ever lost it, but like in, as ever since I've been involved in this work, like for like 20 years, it's always been something that we've pointed to what's happening, what's happened up there. So uh, one of the things that I was really proud of last year is that I was asked to grow some of the native corn um, and was given some seeds and grew just a quarter acre or so of this red corn that the, the Ho-Chunk use uh, in several different ways and um, and uh, was able to save some seed. We'll probably be growing some more this year. Great. Thank you. And do you have archived artwork, events, and community work for the past 20 years? <laughs> Um, what do you mean, like in a closet or you mean like online? Um, yeah, I, we're getting better at that stuff. But some of the, some of the stuff from 10 years ago or 20 years ago, you know, that was back when, you know, like you mimeographed things and, you know, you took 
you know, had printed pictures. And so some of that stuff, you know, maybe the biographers won't be able to, to, to document it. Uh, but uh, it'll be hard for us to, to find the time to generate an archive for, for it. Um, I, I would love for that to happen, but uh, you know, we're still moving forward. And we're, while we're really proud of the work that we've done in the past, I mean, we're really excited about the work that, that lies in front of us. Great. And I don't see any more questions coming in. Do you do you work with youth at all, whether in the inner cities or in the country? Um, for many years, I worked with youth. I mean, in the introduction, I, I've done a lot of work over the years with at-risk youth. Uh, one of the very first projects, you know, when we, we came up here was I brought up a bunch of uh, kids from an art program that I work with in Chicago up here to experience that. So, I mean, so this urban rural flow is something we've done from day one. Um, I, so I used to call myself a uh, farmer, artist, and educator, and I've dropped that educator thing from the list because it, I, I have taught in the classroom, but it's been, it's been many years. And the thing I say somewhat, oh, Donald will get mad at me for saying this, but uh, <laughs> uh, my uh, capacity for working with small children is mostly dissipated, right? I've spent a lot of time doing it. I, I, I know it's really important. And now I work with people who work with people who, who work with kids. So that that's really good. Yeah, it's, it's, it's critically important, but it's, it's, uh, not where my uh, uh, sensibilities are best utilized at this time. Great. Well, thank you so much. I just wanted to thank all of the attendees and you, Jay, that was a wonderful presentation. Thank you. Very inspired. So if any of you are watching, you can go to the Erie Arts and Culture website, webpage or the Facebook page to watch this recording again or to sign up for more events this week. So that's a wrap. Thank you all and have a great rest of your day.